Now a house hearing on the internet and the use of behavioral advertising. This technique has given rise to privacy concerns because it involves advertisers tracking the web browsing habits of internet users. Bobby Rush of Illinois chairs the Commerce Subcommittee on Consumer Protection. This is two and a half hours. Today is a joint hearing on the of the subcommittees on commerce, trade, and consumer protection, and communications technology, and the internet. And I want to welcome all of you to uh, this hearing. And I want to. Uh, just give you some advance notice that in about 20 minutes we will be called to the floor for a series of votes. Some have estimated it to be, uh, was scheduled for about 27 votes on the floor, which is certainly going to extend the hearing. And so we ask that you be patient with us. Uh, we'll try to conduct this hearing and try to be very mindful of your time. And but we are, we will be dictated. Our actions will be dictated by the uh, by, by the house schedule and by the uh, votes on the floor. Uh, now I want to recognize myself for five minutes of our opening statements. As I indicated, uh, today the subcommittees on the two subcommittees, Commerce, Trade, Consumer Protection, and Government Technology and the Internet, uh, combining our commitment to privacy and our resources to conduct an extremely important hearing on behavioral advertising, industry practices, and consumer protections. And I want to just take a moment to thank. Chairman Boucher uh, for not only uh, his cooperation and our working together, our teaming up on this particular issue, but I want to thank him also for his past champions, uh, and championship and dedication uh, to this very, very important issue. Uh, this is but one hearing along a continuum of legislative activity examining the, do the domains of online and offline consumer privacy and how companies handle and treat consumers' personal information. Most recently, the Subcommittee on Commerce, Trade, and Consumer Protection, which I chair, marked up H.R. 2221, the Data Accountability and Trust Act, a bipartisan bill which addresses security of personal information, breaches of that security, and corrects some of the resulting harms to consumers. I'm hopeful that there will be more hearings. There are currently no federal laws specifically governing behavioral advertising, nor do we have a comprehensive general policy, general privacy law. As members of Congress, we have anticipated for some time that this hearing would be highly informative and very valuable in helping us answer the question that everyone seems, uh, seems to ask, is federal privacy legislation necessary or should companies be trusted to discipline and regulate themselves? At this hearing, I look forward to hearing from our very distinguished panel of witnesses about this growing trend on, of online behavior adver advertising. Market research firms have estimated that behaviorally targeted and spending, ad spending, will reach $4.4 billion by the end of 2012. And that number is eye-opening as it translates into almost 25% of all online display and spending that is projected to be spent by year 2012. 
As prevalent as these ads are becoming, so too are the buzzwords, which are purportedly needed to flesh out the appropriate contents of fair information principles and practices. Words and phrases such as transparency, choice, notice, consent, consumer expectation, opt-in and opt-out, simply mean different things to different speakers depending on an array of variables. There's some speed back here. Has there been such variables may include the identity of the user, whether he or she has registered with a visited website, whether the ads are being served by first or third party sites, the sufficiency and conspicuousness of pre-existing privacy policies and disclosure, the robustness of user-enabled settings for managing user privacy, and the list can go on and on and on and on. All of these variables are important to consider, but they can muddle the issue of whether legislation is needed. And I will be listening intently to your accounts of how upfront companies have been about the types of personal information that they are collecting from consumers, what they're doing with the information, and what choices and controls that consumers have over the subsequent use of that information. And I want to thank uh, all the witnesses for coming in this morning, for sharing with us, taking away from your busy schedule to provide input, much needed input, into uh, these matters that we are before, that's before us today. Uh, and I want to thank all the subcommittee members and the staff for so diligently preparing uh, us, this subcommittee, for these hearings. And now I want to recognize for five minutes, uh, for the purposes of opening statements, uh, the ranking member, Mr. Radonovich. Uh, Mr. Radonovich is recognized for five minutes for opening statements. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank you and Chairman Boucher and my fellow ranking member, Mr. Upton, on these hearings today. I think it's a, uh, a good issue that we need to be talking about. Privacy continues to be an issue of increasing concern to consumers, and I'm pleased that we'll be look at, looking at all the relevant issues to determine what the problems are and what possible solutions exist. What was once thought to be an issue limited to business with whom consumers had a customer relationship has been forever altered by the Internet. Progression and innovation in computer and digital technology over the last 20 years has transformed many aspects of our lives. And by the same token, that progress has opened the possibility to potential abuses and invasions into our lives. In the connected world of the Internet, where data is instantaneously accessible to anybody in the world, we have learned how vast amounts of sensitive consumer data can be inadvertently disclosed or subject to more malicious and intentional theft. We also know that the main reason consumers should be concerned about the amount of personal information out there on the World Wide Web is that sensitive personal information can be used for harm harmful purposes, particularly identity theft. Thankfully, we are addressing some of those concerns with the data security and breach notification legislation moving through the committee right now. Our oversight into the data security issue opened our eyes to the types of sensitive personal information many institutions, ranging from businesses to government, maintain about us. And while information is kept about us, uh, maybe for legitimate reasons that mandate data retention, for instance, for law enforcement purposes, most consumers do not fully understand how information gathered about us will be used or with whom it will be shared. These concerns are legitimate. What is more, these concerns over keeping personal information private are exacerbated by digital technology and the capabilities of Internet technology. Information that filled rooms of file cabinets in a in a paper-based business can now be stored on devices that attach to a key ring and can be sent over the Internet in seconds, making information theft easy and often untraceable. 
The ability to instantaneously collect, analyze, and store consumers' online behavior for marketing purposes stretches this dynamic even further. The Internet quickly evolved beyond its original purpose as a communication tool to become a means of commerce, education, and social interaction. A generation has been raised on the Internet with the ability to find information relevant to their interests and communicate in ways that we could not imagine only 10 years ago. And most expect these services to be, uh, to be customized for their pref preferences. But many of these technologies and practices that deliver high levels of customization present new challenges and concerns for consumers, primarily understanding what the trade-off is for these services. Do we need to relinquish personal information about ourselves and our Internet for the purposes of generating more user-specific advertisements in exchange for access to the information we seek on the Internet? And if so, who, is, who has our access to, to this information? The Internet has been a successful tool for commerce and has benefited consumers with convenience, choice, and savings. Relevant advertisements based upon user interests will be more beneficial to the consumer and business, which in concept is no different than the manner in which marketing research determines which advertisements are selected to be placed in magazines, newspapers, or on television based on the intended audience. However, in practice, the Internet is different because of its ability to track preferences on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. The question is how advertisers engage in the process of identifying their potential target audience. Specifically, what information is used to generate targeted advertisements. I have a son who I would do anything to protect. And although I cannot monitor him every waking moment and prohibit his ability to access the Internet, nor would I want nor would I want to, like any parent, I want to trust that he will be safe to surf online and interact with his friends without being unknowingly monitored or profiled. <clears throat> While my son is in a vulnerable demographic, millions of Americans of all ages spend time surfing, posting, and shopping on the Internet. How their information is used and what control the individual has over the collection of their information is at the center of the debate of whether we need a federal privacy law, and if so, how it should be structured and what activities it will address. In the case of my son, I am concerned with the information being gathered and how it is used. I'm less concerned with who is conducting the behavioral profiling or what technology they are using. I thank the witnesses today and I look forward to your testimony, particularly hearing more about what the industry is doing to address many of these concerns in and of itself. Mr. Chairman, I'm ready to work with you and the stakeholders to, ad to address identified problems and ensure whatever solutions developed will equally apply uh, to the behavior regardless of who engages in it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, the Chair, thanks to the gentleman. It is now my uh, privilege and honor to uh, recognize for, the, for five minutes for the purposes of opening statement the chairman of the subcommittee on communications technology uh, and the internet, the gentleman from West Virginia, uh, Ch Chairman Boucher, for five minutes. Well, thank you uh, very much, Chairman Rush. And I, I want to begin this morning by saying thank you to you uh, and to your very fine staff and to uh, Mr. Radonovich from California, your ranking member as well as to Mr. Stearns and, and his staff for the excellent cooperation we've had among ourselves as the plans for this joint hearing of our two subcommittees have progressed. I very much look forward to our continued collaboration as we consider the need for legislation and discuss the principles that privacy protection legislation should embody. Broadband networks are a primary driver of the national economy and it's fundamentally in the nation's interest to encourage their expanded use. One clear way Congress can promote greater use of the Internet for access to information, for electronic commerce, and for entertainment is to assure that Internet users have a high degree of privacy protection, including transparency about information collection practices and uses, and control over the use of the information that is collected from those who use the Internet. 
I have previously announced my desire to work with Chairman Waxman, Chairman Rush, and Ranking Members Barton, Stearns, and Radanovich in order to develop legislation this year, extending to Internet users the assurance that their online experience will be more secure. Such a measure it would be a driver of greater levels of Internet uses, such as electronic commerce, not a hindrance to them. Today's discussion will examine behavioral advertising and ways to enhance consumer protection in association with it. I'm a supporter and a beneficiary of targeted advertising. I would much prefer to receive Internet advertisements that are truly relevant to my particular interests. In fact, I have bought a significant number of items based upon targeted advertising delivered to me from websites that I frequently visit. And so I have a deep appreciation of the value of targeted advertising from the consumer perspective. It's important to note also that online advertising supports much of the commercial content, applications, and services that are available to Internet users without charge. And I have no intention of doing anything that would disrupt that very successful, in fact, essential business model for Internet-based companies. At the same time, I think consumers are entitled to some baseline protections in the online space. Consumers should be given clear, concise information in an easy-to-find privacy policy about what information a website collects about them, how that information is used, how long it is stored, how it's stored, what happens to it when it's no longer stored, and whether it's ever given or sold to third parties. Consumers should be able to opt out of first-party use of the information and for its use by third parties or subsidiaries who are a part of the company's normal first-party transactions or without whom the company could not provide its service. All of that would fall within the ambit of opt-out. Consumers should be able to opt in to use of their information by third parties for those parties' own marketing purposes. This arrangement should not prove to be burdensome. In fact, it's very much in line with the practices of many, if not most, of the reputable service providers today. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about their reactions to this arrangement and how it can best balance Internet business models that depend on online advertising with adequate protection for consumers' privacy. For, examples, uh, for example, have I suggested a workable online opt-in and opt-out consent arrangement, or are there additional situations in which opt-out consent might sometimes be appropriate? What safeguards should be in place in order to ensure that consumers are giving meaningful consent to the sharing of their information both on and off the Internet? What role could self-regulatory organizations play in a statutory arrangement that ensures that all entities that collect information about Internet users abide by a basic set of consumer privacy standards? I also look forward to learning about emerging approaches to enhancing consumer choice and control over the use of information through efforts like the Network Advertising Initiative and persistent opt-out cookies. What benefits could these services offer to consumers? What is the best way to inform consumers about the availability of these services? And again, how should the consumer's meaningful consent be procured? I'm also interested in hearing a purview of what the future of behavioral advertising may hold and what services it might enable and how to accommodate privacy concerns associated with those uh, future services. I want to thank our witnesses for taking the time to join us here today. They represent a broad and diverse range of interests and are all deeply knowledgeable about these subjects. We very much look forward to hearing your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Chair thanks the gentleman. The Chair now recognizes the ranking member of the uh, subcommittee on uh, <coughs> communications, uh, the ranking member. Mr. Stearns from Florida, he's recognized for five minutes for the purposes of opening statements. Good morning and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also want to echo uh, Mr. Boucher's comment that uh, we look forward to working uh, together in a bipartisan fashion 
uh, on a very important bill. And I want to thank the witnesses for coming this morning. I think, uh, for the most part, you're going to educate us. You're the experts here, and uh, we respect your opinions. Uh, we want to do no harm here. So um, I think when we look at this uh, possibility of federal legislation dealing with privacy, we want to make sure that is consumer centric. Um, consumers don't care if you're a search engine or a broadband provider. They just want to ensure that the privacy, their, their, their assurance that their privacy is protected. We must empower them uh, to make these privacy decisions themselves. Uh, they feel, they know uh, uh, how, how much want to be collected and what should not be collected. Congress cannot and should not make that decision for them, but it can play a role in making sure consumers have have the information simply to make their own choices. Now, that means companies should be as transparent as possible about what information they collect and, of course, how they're using it. That way, consumers will be better able to make informed privacy decisions. Uh, this transparency should include robust disclosure and notice outside the privacy policy. Notice and disclosure needs to be clear and conspicuous so the consumers know that. First, some information is being collected. Second, what is the information that's being collected? How is it being used? And third, how to prevent this information being collected if they so desire? By giving the consumer more robust and transparent information, uh, we can strike the proper balance between privacy protection and strong Internet uh, commerce. Furthermore, furthermore, my colleagues, I want to emphasize two principles that should play a prominent role in our examination of this issue. First, we should apply the same privacy standard to companies that are engaged in similar conduct with similar information. But we should avoid applying those same standards to entities that do not use the same types of information for the same purposes and do not have anywhere near the same volume of information about the prospective consumer. For example, search engines and internet advertising networks may use a consumer's visit to a particular website to create profiles for purposes not directly related to the reason for the visit. Other entities, like web publishers, collect information only to provide the very service the consumer has come for. Our approach should recognize that. Second, any legislation in this area should hold various parties accountable only for that which they know and control. We should be wary of efforts to make any one party responsible for the actions of others. Consumers' online activities provide advertisers with valuable information upon which to market their products and their services. Collecting this type of information for targeted advertising is very important because it simply allows many of these products and services to remain free to consumers. Without this information, websites would either have to cut back on their free information and services or would have to start charging a fee. Neither result is good for the consumers. Overreaching privacy regulation could have a significant negative economic impact at a time when many businesses in our economy are struggling. So let's be very careful on these issues before we leap to uh, legislative regulatory proposals. Uh, when I was chairman of the Commerce Consumer Protection and Trade, I held a number of hearings on privacies. I worked uh, with uh, Chairman Boucher and we developed a Consumer Privacy Protection Act, which we uh, uh, dropped as a bill. Uh, this bill would have required data collectors to provide consumers with information on the entity collecting the information and the purposes for which the information was being collected. I believe it was and still is a good base bill to use as we make, as we move forward to develop a new privacy bill. Also, I'd like to bring up an issue perhaps that many of us have thought about, and I don't want to bog down our discussion about it. Which agency will regulate and enforce privacy standards? Will it be the FCC or the Federal Trade Commission? A combination or possibly a new agency? I know this issue won't be solved this morning, but it's something we're going to have to work out and work through, and I look forward to doing this on a bipartisan fashion. And I'd be interested, if possible, if some of the witnesses could give us their feelings about how the jurisdiction of this privacy bill would be best uh, um, supervised with. So, Mr. Chairman, I would conclude by pointing out we, we've talked a little bit in previous hearings about deep pocket inspection. Uh, the point is that whether a company uses deep pocket inspection or reads your email directly, 
this should be part of the privacy rules in some way. So I think our witnesses can also help us on uh, that particular aspect. So I look forward to hearing and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. The chair, thanks to the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Space, for two minutes for the purposes of opening statements. Uh, thank you, Chairman Rush and Chairman Boucher, Ranking Member Radonovich and Ranking Member Stearns for convening uh, us today on the topic of behavioral advertising. I was struck when reviewing Professor Felton's testimony by a comment that he makes. Uh, quote, responsible ad services typically collect less information and track users less intensively than the technology would allow, end quote. To me, this means that just because we can doesn't mean that we should. I certainly understand the need for companies to advertise on their sites. Doing so is what enables our constituents to access free content, products, and services online. And I also understand the desire of ad companies to supply consumers with ads that are more, of more relevance to them. This is a better business model for the companies and potentially a service to consumers. However, I want to make clear that one bad apple could spoil the whole bunch here. The moment online consumers believe their personal information is at risk of corruption, misuse, or theft will be the moment this approach we are discussing today will cease to work. I strongly believe it is in the interest of all parties to disclose to consumers their advertising practices and intent and to ensure that consumers' personal information is strictly guarded against security breaches and exploitation. I look forward to these uh, conversations today and to working with my colleagues on this issue as we move forward. I yield back my time. The Chair, thanks to the gentleman. It is now my pleasure and honor to recognize for five minutes for the purposes of opening statements the ranking member of the full Committee on Energy and Commerce, uh, Mr. Barton, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I look on the other side of the aisle, I'm, I am um, gladdened to see that none of the Democrats that played on the Democratic baseball team are actually in the room. Uh, <laughs> so I can congratulate them uh, in their absence and I won't have to do it face to face when I see them on the floor. But last night, Mike Doyle, who is the manager of the team, and Bart Stupak, who is, is on this committee, um, played a, uh, an amazing game. It wasn't their usual democratic bumbling era game. <laughs> They actually played very well and as a team, and um, as a result, they beat the stalwart Republicans 15 to 10. Uh, John Shimkus, who is our starting pitcher, played an excellent game, and we had a number of uh, energy and commerce Republicans. Mr. Gingrich, Dr. Gingrich, who's here, um, walked at a key time and later scored. Mr. Scalise, who is here, uh, played second base some and also did some base running and scored. So uh, uh, Mr. Pitts, who he came out and watched the game and <laughs> luckily didn't try to play, <laughs> although we could have used his bombing skills from uh, the Vietnam War. So in any way, we raised quite a bit of money for charity and had a good time. And when y'all see Mike Doyle uh, and you see that he's grinning from ear to ear, I just congratulate him and tell him to take pity on the downtrodden Republicans who uh, didn't quite have the stuff last night. On this hearing, Mr. Chairman, uh, I do want to thank you, I thank Mr. Boucher, Mr. Stearns, Mr. Radonovich uh, for working in a bipartisan fashion to protect the, uh, the privacy and security of, security of every American's personal information. Uh, I'm glad that we are uh, working on this in a bipartisan way. <coughs> I especially appreciate Chairman Rush's ag agreement to uh, act on the Republicans' uh, data security bill. That bill has implications for the broader privacy discussion, and I hope that that bill will move forward in the full committee. Uh, along with uh, uh, Congressman Markey, I chair or co-chair the Congressional Privacy Caucus, so I'm glad that we are working on these issues in a bipartisan way. I myself, every few days, uh, uh, hit the delete button and, and clean out all the uh, various cookies on the computers that uh, are in my office and, and at my home. Uh, it's amazing to me how many of those uh, accumulate uh, and most of the time without 
absolutely any knowledge of myself or anybody else for that matter that they're being put on our computer. Uh, I think it's a big deal if somebody tracks uh, where you go and what you look at without your uh, personal uh, uh, approval. <coughs> we wouldn't like that in the non-internet uh, world and I personally don't like it in the internet world. The information about myself is mine. Unless I choose to share it, uh, I would just assume that it stay my information only. I think that I have the right to know what information people are gathering about me and the right to know what they're doing with it. Um, it's obvious that the public agrees with the statement that I just made because poll after poll shows that uh, they think that their information and their right to privacy is just as important on the internet as it is in the uh, non-internet world. Uh, when I open an email for the new Dallas Cowboy Stadium uh, that is in my congressional district, um, I don't expect to begin receiving unsolicited ads for airline tickets to the Dallas-Fort Worth area or hotels also in my district in Arlington, Texas. Um, it's obvious that people um, track what I do and where I go and um, try to take advantage of that. Fortunately, technology has come quite a ways uh, in protecting the individuals. Uh, we started looking at the spyware problem back in the 107th Congress, and uh, thanks to the work of, <coughs> among others, Congressman Mary Bono Mack, uh, Ed Towns, Chairman Dingell, uh, those spyware infections are not near the problem that they used to be. However, today, companies continue to gather, maintain, and use data uh, through a variety of technological methods. Some of those companies, such as Verizon and Comcast, uh, are large companies. They're regulated in some parts of their business model, and I think they are trying to act appropriately. There are other companies, uh, so-called ISP uh, locators, uh, that we don't even, I personally don't even know their name. Uh, then you have the in-between companies, the so-called edge companies like Yahoo and Google. Um, put together, it, it, it still is a little bit of a wild west out there, and uh, I think it's time that Congress begin to look at that and try to try to bring uh, some law and order uh, to that particular wild west um, area. I see that my time's expired, Mr. Chairman, so I'll submit the rest of the statement for the record. Suffice it to say that I'm glad that you and Congressman Boucher are working with the Republicans. Uh, and taking a serious look at this. I also want to commend the private sector that's here today. It's my understanding that you're working together uh, to come up with some voluntarily, some voluntary rules, um, and it is always preferable, in my opinion, to do it through a voluntary uh, market-based approach as opposed to a mandatory regulatory approach. So um, in any event, uh, again, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and once again, uh, congratulations to the Democrats for winning the baseball game last night. Uh, I the, yield back. The, the chair thanks uh, the ranking member. And it's now my uh, honor to recognize the gentlelady from California for two minutes for the purposes of opening statement. Ms. Matsui. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and Chairman Rush for calling today's joint hearing and applaud both your leadership in addressing this important issue. I'd also like to thank our panelists for being here with us this morning. Today we are here to examine the practices and consumer protections from a growing online advertisement practice known as behavioral advertising. As broadband access continues to expand across this country, more and more Americans will rely on the Internet for news information, okay. online videos, yeah. and to purchase goods and services. Yet Americans need to have trust and confidence that their personal information will be properly protected. Privacy policies and disclosures should be clear and transparent so consumers can choose what information they want to view and receive on the Internet instead of inappropriate collection and misuse of their information. Consumers should also understand the scope of the information that's being collected, what it's being used for, the length of time it's being retained, and its security. The more information that consumers have, the better. 
Moving forward, we must ensure that Americans are comfortable with using the Internet and know with confidence that meaningful privacy safeguards are in place while ensuring that we don't stifle innovation. I thank you, both of you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing today, and I yield back the balance of my time. The chair thanks the general lady. Now the chair recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Whitfield, for five minutes for the purposes of. Oh, oh, let me correct that. The chair recognizes the gentleman. It's okay. I'm not. No, I'm, my, <laughs> please. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan. I, I thank my, my friend, uh, and I'll not take my two minutes. Uh, that we have great attendance. We'll see what the attendance is after lunch when we return after these votes. Uh, I would like to associate myself with uh, Mr. Barton's remarks. Uh, the information is yours. When you make a phone call, no matter who it is, you don't expect AT&T or Verizon to share the information with somebody else. You can imagine if you ordered a pizza on the phone and all of a sudden you get uh, different pizza companies uh, then coming in knowing that you're going to be subscribing to that. That information is personal. shouldn't be shared unless that individual allows and knows that it's going to be shared. Uh, it needs to be protected. It's nobody's business. Don't expect to have someone follow you in your car when you go make an errand, whether it be to a dry cleaner or wherever you might go, and expect some competitor then to perhaps get the information uh, to trace you back. So this is a great hearing. I look forward to it, and I yield back the balance of my time. The chair, th thanks the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from uh, Georgia, Mr. Barrow, for two minutes for the purposes of opening statements. I thank the chairman. I'm going to wave an opening, but I'm going to thank the ranking member for his kind words of congratulations to the Democrats. And in solidarity with Mr. Pitts, I want to remind the ranking member that those of us who sit in the stands and cheer also serve. Thank you very much. <laughs> now recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Whitfield, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We uh, certainly appreciate all these witnesses being here today as we explore this very important uh, subject. As uh, online companies use an array of sophisticated and ever-evolving data collection and profiling applications, it is important that we focus on protecting privacy. Uh, today, I think we'll be hearing about privacy policies of various companies, uh, the data retention that they do. And uh, as we proceed and think about legislation, it's imperative that we uh, use a balanced approach and proceed with caution. And uh, I think if we do have any uh, legislation, it sh certainly should apply equally to all entities throughout the Internet uh, ecosystem. And I'll yield back, balance my time. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman uh, from Ohio, Mr. Pitts, from Pennsylvania, Mr. Pitts, recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I worked real hard in the opening statement, but I'll, I think I'll submit it for the record. Just let me say, uh, I believe that uh, consumer privacy rights should be carefully guarded. I'm also encouraged by private industry's recent steps to further protect consumers. It's my hope that if legislative action is taken, that we'll do so in a careful manner, striking a delicate balance between the necessary steps we must take to protect consumers and the ability for industry to continue to be successful. So with that, I'll submit the, the rest for the record and yield back. The chair thanks the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from uh, from Georgia, Dr. Gingery, for two minutes for the purposes of opening statement. Chairman Rush and Chairman Boucher, uh, Ranking Member Rodonovich and Stearns, I want to thank you for calling this hearing today on the emerging use of behavioral or interest-based advertising online. While this type of advertising only represents a small portion of all online ads, by 2012, this type of advertising is estimated to reach $4.4 billion in revenue. Therefore, it is important for these subcommittees to take a further look at this industry in order that we ensure the online privacy of consumers. When hearing testimony from this panel today, I believe that it will be important that we focus on three components of any potential regulation that these subcommittees propose. 
First, it's important to distinguish what it is that we are going to be regulating. Currently, most interest-based advertising is conducted through the use of web browser cookies. These encoded text files help indicate a user's online activity, thereby enabling advertisers to customize ads based on a series of preferences. However, as we have seen in the IT industry, particularly over this last decade, technology moves very quickly. And if we are to propose regulations for this industry, then we must make the determination of exactly how and what we are going to regulate. Mr. Chairman, we must also examine which federal agency would be best suited to coordinate any potential regulation. Both the Federal Communications Commission, FCC, and the Federal Trade Commission have jurisdiction over elements of behavioral advertising. Therefore, for the sake of consumers, if regulations are necessary, we must coordinate the efforts and responsibilities of these two governmental entities, thereby allowing for industry growth while at the same time safeguarding an individual's private information. Lastly, Mr. Chairman, we would also have to determine whom would we would be regulating. Would it be the Internet service provider or, or the advertisers or the web interfacing companies represented here today? Accordingly, I think we will, it will be important that as we move forward, we diligently take the time to hear from ISP companies and advertisers as a way to give us different perspective on this important issue that will continue to be crucial to the further development of online activity. Mr. Chairman, the heart of this hearing is the American consumer, so our focus must be their overall protection. I look forward to hearing from the panel, and I yield back the balance of my time. The Chair thanks the gentleman. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from uh, Louisiana, Mr. Scalise, for two minutes for the purposes of opening statements. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank you and the ranking members of the subcommittees uh, for having this hearing on behavioral advertising. I'm pleased that both subcommittees are examining this issue as well as the greater issue of data privacy. I know that Congress and this committee have held hearings on data privacy in the past, but as we all know, technology continues to advance and develop in ways that provide tremendous benefits to consumers. But these adva uh, ben advancements and benefits expo can expose consumers to certain risks. Therefore, we must continue to examine ways to ensure consumers don't have their personal information compromised. The technology industry is one of the most advanced and competitive industries in our country. It is also one of the most beneficial, both for consumers and for our economy. We're able to share information, exchange ideas, and conduct commerce in ways that were never imagined just a few decades ago. The industry also provides millions of good, high-paying jobs for people all across this country. One thing that I think we must, uh, that must be pointed out is that the industry has evolved and grown on its own with little regulation from the federal government. Uh, some would say that the government's failure to regulate this industry is one of the reasons it's grown and provided so many good jobs. Yes, there have been bad actors in the industry, and there are issues we must address in protecting consumers' personal information. But I hope that we would proceed with caution when stepping in or when drafting legislation in this area. I hope the focus of today's hearing is how we can protect consumers and their personal information and what steps the industry will take to do that. I hope today's hearing does not focus on how the government can improve the industry. As we continue to delve into this industry uh, and this, this issue today and future hearings, we should focus on the consumer and what will offer consumers the greatest transparency into the online practices and give them meaningful control over their personal information. For this reason, I believe that self-regulation is sufficient and if privacy regulatory re requirements are needed, they should be consistent across the industry and not be greater for one technology compared to another. Everyone involved in online advertising, ISPs, search engines, advertising networks, website publishers, and others should all be subject to the same requirements, and Congress should not try to pick winners and losers. After all, consumers are not always aware that their Internet activities are being tracked. They care about what information is collected and what it's used for. They want to know if this is going on, and if so, they should be able to opt out if they so choose and be assured that a breach of their personal information will not occur. I look forward to the hearing and the comments from our panelists today, particularly on self-regulation and what changes they will make to ensure that protection of personal information uh, and what changes they plan on making moving forward. It is important that these, committee, uh, th these committees and subcommittees understand their positions and activities as well as all the implications of these new advertising practices. Thank you, and I yield back. 
The chair, thanks to the gentleman. Uh, as uh, I indicated earlier, uh, there's a vote occurring on the House floor. It's a series of votes. Uh, and so we will uh, uh, recess the committee until uh, the completion of those votes. And uh, we will reconvene uh, uh, 15 minutes after the completion of those votes. The committee now stands in recess. The committee will uh, reconvene. Uh, I certainly want to thank uh, each and every one of you for uh, your patience. I want to also apologize for uh, the time that you have been forced to spend uh, here. Uh, this has been an abnormal day with a lot of abnormal activities. And uh, I might add, it's been a record-breaking day. We've, uh, according to some note, uh, we've had at least 54 consecutive votes, one after another. And that's never happened before, as, as we know. So it's not something we we're proud of, but the fact that it is that has been that kind of a day. And we're going to proceed uh, go right to uh, our witnesses. Uh, I want to start on my left uh, to the right. Uh, we will proceed with uh, introducing our witnesses. Um, Mr. Jeffrey Chester is the executive director for the Center for Digital. Digital. Okay. Well, now let me. All right. Uh, Miss, let me. Okay, this is the correct. Mr. Let me start over again. Mr. Edward W. Felton is uh, a professor of computer science at Princeton University. Next to Mr. Felton is Ms. Mrs. Ann Toth. She's the vice president of policy and head of private privacy for Yahoo. Uh, Ms. Nicole Wong is the Deputy General Counsel responsible for privacy for Google. Uh, Mr. Christopher R. Kelly is the Chief Privacy Officer at Facebook. Facebook. Mr. Jeffrey Chester now is the Executive Director of the Center for Digital Democracy. Mr. Charles D. Coran, is that how you pronounce that? Coran is the executive director of Network Advertising Initiative. And Mr. Scott Cleland is the president of Precursor uh, LLC. Well, again, we want to thank the witnesses for their patience and for their appearance before the subcommittee this morning. It is the practice of this subcommittee now that we will swear in all the witnesses. So would you please stand and raise your right hand. <clears throat> Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Uh, let the record reflect that all the witnesses have uh, responded in the affirmative. And now we are asked uh, the uh, witnesses to enter into opening statements. And uh, Mr. Felton, we are recognized for five minutes or thereabouts. Okay, so uh, please uh, pull the mic in front. Yes, turn it on and let it rip. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Chairman Rush, Chairman Boucher, for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Edward Felton. I'm a professor of computer science and public affairs at Princeton University. Uh, I am here as a technologist. In my, um, I'm a computer science professor, and I'd like to explain some of the technology behind behavioral advertising. 
The most serious privacy concerns are raised not by the presence of advertising, but by the gathering of information about users that can be used either to target ads or for other purposes. I'd like to describe what technology makes possible. Responsible ad services do not do everything that's possible, and I don't mean to imply otherwise. Others on the panel can describe what their own systems do do. To explain what this technology allows, I'd like to walk through a scenario illustrated by the diagram on the last page of my written testimony. And if I could have the, uh, uh, the display, please, of the PowerPoint. We're trying to bring that up. I'm sorry. What I'd like to describe, Mr. Chairman, is a um, uh, is a scenario um, in involving um, behavioral advertising. Um, thank you. And this, in this beginning of the scenario, uh, I go to a weather site. And I look up Thursday's forecast for Washington. The weather site sends me a page with the forecast information uh, and a hole where the ad should be. And along with that page, it sends, me, uh, sends my computer a command uh, telling it how to find the ad. Following these instructions, my web browser connects to an ad service, shown here at the bottom, and asks for an ad. <coughs> along with this request, information is sent to the ad service about me the fact that I'm looking up Thursday's forecast for Washington, and the fact that I normally look up the forecast in Princeton, New Jersey. The ad service remembers this information. The ad service sends an ad which is inserted into the page. The service also send, sends an ad in this case related to travel to Washington because I looked up the Washington DC forecast. The service also sends along a so-called cookie which contains a small unique code, which in this example in the diagram is 7592. And my computer stores this cookie. Later, I visit a social network page, which also contains an ad. Again, the page has a blank space for the ad, and my computer contacts the ad service to get an ad. My computer automatically sends along the cookie that the service uh, provided earlier. This request for an ad carries more information about me. It says that I'm interested in baseball and jazz, which the social network site knows, and that my name is Edward Felton. The ad service recognizes that the cookie is the same as before, so it knows that I'm the same person who looked up DC weather earlier. So, and it adds the new information to its profile of me. The service sends back an ad. This time it's an ad for Washington Nationals tickets, because I looked up Washington weather earlier, and I'm interested in baseball. Notice that the ad, is connecting, the ad service is connecting the dots between things that I did on different sites, between something I did on the weather site and something I did on the social network site. This allows it to better target ads and also to build up a more extensive profile about me. Next, I go to a bookstore and look up books about travel in Hawaii. The bookstore site sends this information to the ad service along with another ad request. Again, the cookie allows the ad service to link together my bookstore activities with my earlier activities on other sites. The ad service sends back an ad for jazz CDs because it knows I like jazz because the social network site told it. By this point, the ad service knows enough to identify me. It knows I live in Princeton, and it knows that my name is Edward Felton. The ad service buys access to a third-party commercial database using, its, using what it knows about my identity to get more information about me. In this example, the ad service gets my credit card, my credit report, and my insurance history, which it adds to my profile along with the other information it had. And finally, I go to a news site that uses the same ad service. My computer again requests an ad. The ad service in this case sends an ad for budget Hawaiian vacations. It knows that I'm interested in visiting Hawaii because I looked at Hawaii books at the bookstore. And it knows I'm interested in a low-cost trip because it has my credit report. The news site sends information about what I was reading. In this example, I was reading about cancer treatments. This information is added to my profile as well. In this scenario, the ad service got information in three ways. First, content providers sent along information about what I was doing on their sites and what I had done in the past. Second, the ad service connected the dots to link my activities across different sites at different times. 
And third, the ad service accessed third-party commercial databases. All of this information ended up in my profile. The result was well-targeted ads, but also the creation of an electronic profile of me containing sensitive information, which could in principle be resold or reused for other purposes. Now, ad services are not the only parties who can assemble such profiles, but large ad services do have a prime opportunity to build profiles due to their relationships with many content providers who can pass along information about users, and due to the ad service's ability to connect the dots by linking together a user's activities across different websites. All of this is possible as a technical matter, which is not to say that responsible ad services do all of it, or even most of it. Ad services may be restrained by law, by self-regulation, or by market pressures. What is clear is that technology by itself cannot protect users from broad gathering and use of information. Mr. Felton, I, I, I'm embarrassed to say this, but would you please bring your, uh, your statement to a close? Uh, you extended your time. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I was just wrapping up. I, I, um, I just wanted to thank the committee for holding this hearing and for giving me the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, Mrs. Toth, uh, is it Toth or Toth? It's Toth. So, Ms. So, Mrs. Toth, you're recognized for five minutes for the purposes of opening statements. Chairman Boucher and Rush, Ranking Members Stearns and Radanovich, members of the subcommittees, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today at this important hearing. My name is Ann Toth, and I am Yahoo's Vice President of Policy and Head of Privacy. I joined the company over 11 years ago and became one of the very first dedicated privacy professionals at any online company. Quite simply, my job is about making sure Yahoo earns and maintains its users' trust each and every day. Yahoo is founded by Jerry Yang and David Philo, who are trying to help people find information that was useful and relevant to them among the clutter of the early World Wide Web. What began as a directory of popular websites quickly grew into a globally recognized brand that provides a wide range of innovative and useful products and services to 500 million users worldwide. The internet has changed a great deal, and this hearing recognizes its importance in our global economy. Gone are the days of one-size-fits-all internet content. Our consumers expect not only that Yahoo will meet their needs, but that we will anticipate those needs as well. The same is true for advertising. Consumers are more likely to click on advertising that speaks directly to them and their interests. For example, Yahoo might deliver ads featuring hybrid cars if a user spent a great deal of time on Yahoo Green or has recently browsed car reviews on Yahoo Autos. Put simply, customized advertising helps consumers save time and energy. As you may know, Yahoo offers our industry-leading products and services largely for free. Our business also depends almost entirely on the trust of our users. It has been paramount to our growth and is critical for our future success. Our approach to privacy couples front-end transparency, meaningful choice, and user education with back-end protections for data that limit how much information and how long personal identifiers are maintained. Let's start by talking about transparency. Our leading-edge privacy center, which you can see in the slide that's being projected, provides easy navigation, information on special topics, and gives prominence to our opt-out page. And actually, if we could move to the next slide making it simple for users to find and exercise their privacy choices. We have also experimented with a number of ways to provide notice and transparency outside of standard privacy policies, giving users multiple privacy touch points. We must also put control in the hands of our users. We have an opt-out that now applies to interest-based advertising both on and off the Yahoo network of websites. Whether a user touches us as a first-party publisher or as a third-party ad network, we want them to have a choice. We also didn't want users to have to redo their opt-outs again and again, and took the further step of making our opt-out persistent for users who've registered for a Yahoo account. This means that these users who clear their cookies will not inadvertently clear their privacy choices at the same time. The final aspect of the front end of privacy protection is user education. For over a year, Yahoo has displayed on average 200 million ads per month that explain our approach to privacy. All of these front-end steps are complemented by back-end protections. We focus on security and data retention as core aspects of protecting back-end privacy. We recently announced the industry's leading data retention policy. Under this policy, we will retain the vast majority of our weblog data in identifiable form for only 90 days. This dramatically reduces the period of time we will hold log file data in identifiable form. 
and vastly increases the scope of data covered by the policy. The limited exceptions to this policy are explained more fully in my written testimony. We believe that our front-end, back-end approach to privacy builds a circle of trust with users, providing transparency, meaningful choice, and extensive education coupled with strong security and minimum data retention. Much attention has been recently paid to the question of whether an opt-out or an opt-in approach to user control in the area of interest-based advertising is best. The answer is both. The decision about whether to ask for opt-in consent or give users the opportunity to opt out depends on the individual services being provided and the information being collected. Most advances in online privacy protection have come as a result of industry initiative and self-regulation. Market forces drive companies like Yahoo to bring privacy innovations to customers quickly. As one company leads, many others follow or leapfrog by innovating in new ways. So as Congress considers its role in helping protect consumer privacy online, Yahoo hopes that legislators will consider an approach that enables providers to keep pace not only with technological advances, but with customer demands and expectations as well. I am very proud of Yahoo's record of trust and commitment to privacy and the industry's history of self responsible self-regulation. I look forward to sharing our experience with you in more depth, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Toth. Uh, now the chair recognizes Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong, uh, uh, you have five minutes or thereabouts. Thank you. Chairman Russian Boucher, Ranking Members Radonovich and Stearns, and members of the committee, I'm pleased to appear before you this evening to discuss online advertising and the ways that Google protects our users' privacy. Online advertising is critically important to our economy. It promotes freer, more robust, and more diverse speech. It enables many thousands of small businesses to connect with consumers across the nation and around the world. It helps support the hundreds of thousands of blogs, online newspapers, and other web publications that we read every day. Over the last decade, the industry has struggled with the challenges of providing behavioral advertising. On the one hand, well-tailored ads benefit consumers, advertisers, and publishers alike. On the other hand, we recognize the need to deliver relevant ads while respecting users' privacy. In March, Google entered this space and announced our release of intraspace advertising for our AdSense partner sites and for YouTube. Intraspace advertising uses information about the web pages people visit to make the online ads they see more relevant. And relevant advertising has fueled much of the content, products, and services available on the internet today. As Google prepared to roll out intraspace advertising, we talked to many users, privacy and consumer advocates, and government experts. Those conversations led us to realize that we needed to solve three important issues in order to provide consumers with greater transparency and choice, which are core design principles at Google. First, who served the ad? Second, what information is being collected and how is it being used? And finally, how can consumers be given more control over how their information is used? This evening, I'd like to show you how we answered each of those questions with the launch of intraspace advertising, which includes innovative, consumer-friendly features to provide meaningful transparency and choice for our users. When you see an ad online ad today, you generally don't know much about that ad. It's difficult to tell who provided the ad and how your information is being collected and used. Google is trying to solve this problem by providing a link to more information right in the ad, as you can see where it's labeled Ads by Google. This is very different from current industry practices, but we believe that it is important to provide users with more information about the ad right at the point of interaction. We believe that this is a significant innovation that empowers consumers, and we think that this is the direction that many in the industry are going. If you're curious about getting information about the ad, you can click on the Google link and navigate to an information page about Google Ads, which you can see here. On this page, you're invited to visit our Ads Preference Manager, which helps explain in, plain, in a plain language, user-friendly format what information is being collected, how it's being used, and how you can exercise choice and get more information about how this advertising product works. Here's the Ads Preference Manager. This innovative tool allows you to see what interests are associated with an advertising cookie, the double-click cookie, that is set in the browser you're using. In this case, Google has inferred from my cook that my cookie should be associated with hybrid cars, movie rentals and sales, and real estate. This is because I've visited sites using the browser about hybrids, movies, and real estate. 
Before Google introduced the Ads Preference Manager, most users had no idea what interests were being associated with their cookies online by advertising companies. We're the first major company to introduce this kind of transparency. Now you can see those interests, and if you don't agree with those interests, maybe you're not a movie fan or you simply don't want to see ads about movies, you can delete any one of them, or as, ma or a few or as many as you want. So for example, if you want to delete movie rentals and sales, you can do that with one click. And I've just done that. Likewise, you can add any interests you like. Note that Google does not use sensitive categories. So there's nothing in here about sexual orientation, religious affiliation, health status, or the like. But there are many, many other options. For example, if you're a sports fan, you can associate your cookie with sports. And with a click, I've decided that I'd like to receive ads personalized for sports fans. If you prefer not to see interest-based ads from Google, you can opt out at any time with one click. After you opt out, Google won't collect information for interest-based advertising, and you won't receive interest-based ads from us. You'll still see ads, but they may not be as relevant. The opt-out is achieved by attaching an opt-out cookie to your browser. Opt-out cookies in the industry, however, have traditionally not been persistent. That is, they're often inadvertently deleted from the browser when a user deletes her cookies. So our engineers have developed a tool that was not, only, that was not previously available that makes Google's opt-out cookie permanent, even when users clear other cookies from their browsers. After you opt out, just click the download button and follow the instructions to install a browser plugin that saves your opt-out settings even when you clear your cookies. I hope this gives you a better idea of how Google shows interest-based ads and how we provide users with transparency in the right place at the right time as well as meaningful, granular, and user-friendly choices for setting ad preferences or opting out. Thank you very much for your time. <clears throat> Next, uh, we welcome uh, Mr. Kelly. Mr. Kelly, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Chairman Russian Voucher and Ranking Members Radonovich and Stearns and members of the subcommittees. Thank you for this opportunity to address important privacy matters on the Internet. We agree with you that protecting privacy is critical to the future growth of the Internet economy. Facebook now serves more than 200 million active users worldwide, roughly 70 million of whom are in the United States. We are a technology company that gives people the power to share their lives and experiences in an authentic and trusted environment, making the world more open and connected. Facebook's privacy settings gives user, give users control over how they share their information, allowing them to choose the friends they accept the affiliations they choose, and how their information is shared with their friends, and if they desire, the world at large. Today, I would like to make four key points. First, Facebook's user-centric approach to privacy is unique, innovative, and empowers consumers. Our privacy-centric principles are at the core of our advertising model. Second, in offering its free service to users, Facebook is dedicated to developing advertising that is relevant and personal without invading users' privacy, and to giving users more control over how their personal information is used in the online advertising environment. Third, we primarily achieve these objectives by giving users control over how they share their personal information that model real-world information sharing and providing them transparency about how we use their information in advertising. And fourth, the Federal Trade Commission's behavioral advertising principles recognize the important distinctions made by Facebook in its ad targeting between the use of aggregate, non-personally identifiable information that is not shared or sold to third parties versus other sites and companies surreptitious harvesting, sharing, and sale of personally identifiable information to third party companies. Facebook understands that few of us want to be hermits sharing no information with anyone, nor do many of us want to share everything with everyone, though some do want that. Most people seek to share information with friends, families, and other, fam their family and others that they share a social context with on a regular basis, seeking to control who gets our information and how they have access to it. People come to Facebook to share information. We give them the technological tools to manage that sharing. Contrary to some popular misconceptions, full information on Facebook users isn't even available to most users on Facebook, let alone all users of the Internet. If someone is searching for new friends on Facebook, all that she might see about other users who are not yet her friends would be the limited information that those users have decided to make available. Most of our users choose to limit what profile information is available to non-friends. They have extensive and precise controls available to choose who sees what among their networks and friends, as well as tools that give them the choice to make a limited information, uh, set of information available to search engines and other outside entities. 
We are constantly refining these tools to allow users to make informed choices. Everyday use of the site educates users as to the power they have over how they share their information, and user feedback informs everything that we do. Facebook is transparent with our users about the fact that we are an advertising-based business, and we explain to them fully the uses of their personal data that they are authorizing by interacting with Facebook either on Facebook.com or on the over 10,000 Facebook Connect sites throughout the web. Ads targeted to user preferences and demographics have always been part of the advertising industry. The critical distinction that we embrace in our advertising policies and practices and that we want this committee to understand is between the use of personal information for advertisements in personally identifiable form and the use, dissemination, or sharing of information with advertisers in non-personally identifiable form. Users should choose what information they share with advertisers. This is a distinction that few companies make, and Facebook does it because we believe it protects user privacy. Ad targeting that shares or sells personal information to advertisers, name, email, or other contact information, without user control is materially different from targeting that only gives advertisers the ability to present their ads based on aggregate data. So to take in Dr. Felton's example, um, if you were to navigate to the social networking site in his example, if it were Facebook, that, that we would not be sharing with the ad provider that he was Edward Felton or that he liked jazz. So on Facebook, a feedback loop is established where people know what they are uploading and receive timely reactions from their friends. The privacy policy and users' experience inform them about how advertising on the service works. Advertising that enables us to provide the service for free to users is targeted to the expressed attributes of a profile and presented in the page, the space on the page allocated, allocated for advertising without granting an advertiser access to any individual user's profile. Unless a user decides otherwise by directly and voluntarily sharing information with an advertiser, advertisers can only target Facebook advertisements against non-personally identifiable attributes of a user de uh, derived from profile data. Facebook builds and supports products founded on the principles of transparency and user control, and we thank you very much for the opportunity to present our philosophy uh, in the approach to online advertising before this committee. The, the chair thanks the gentleman. The chair now recognizes Mr. Chesner for five minutes. I want to thank uh, the chairs and ranking members and the members of the committee uh, for their interest in privacy, for holding this hearing, and to uh, support their efforts to, I think, help Americans get a fair digital data deal, and that's what they deserve. Just very quickly before I make four points, I submitted my testimony in writing. It tries to lay out for the committee the broad parameters of the interactive advertising system as we know it in the United States, all the various elements mm -hmm. that now are shaping this very powerful system. So I'll, you, can, you can look at that if you want more information. I've been working on these issues for 15 years, looking at online advertising, online marketing, digi digital communications. I last worked closely with the Commerce Committee back in 1998 when we led the campaign uh, that established with uh, your legislation the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. Right now that's the only online privacy law. You, uh, it was a bipartisan effort. And uh, what, we, what we did for kids, we now need to do for teens and adults. Mm -hmm. Imagine a world and this is the world that we've created. And you've already spoken about it. Both the, the, the chair spoke about it, Mr. Barton spoke about it, others have spoke about it. Imagine a world where every move you're being watched, when, whatever content you read, what you buy, how much you're willing to spend, and how much you're not willing to, to, to spend, where you go, what you like, what you don't like, all that being compiled, outside databases being used, to even build up this even larger profile of who you are. They even include your race, whether you're low income or middle class. They, they call it in the online ad industry digital fingerprints or user DNA. But this very powerful system <clears throat> that's invisible and unaccountable to the average American is constantly collecting and refining and storing all this information and making claims and assumptions about you, your reputation, without any accountability to you as the consumer, let alone as the citizen.
That is the online advertising system today as we know it. It's different from traditional advertising because as you yourself described, right, it's able to track you minute by minute, minute by, by second. And your information is being sold in online ad auctions in, in milliseconds. They know who you are and they're selling access to it. So it's an incredible system that we've created. And, and it's now enmeshed in almost everything we do online, watching online videos, even email, doing searches, playing games, this broad data collection system. There's a digital data collection arms race going on as they build this incredibly sophisticated system. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I want to make it clear from my, my second point that our call for privacy and consumer protection rules isn't about undermining the role of online advertising and marketing. That has an important role to play. It's the underpinning, the foundation of our modern publishing system, our really our new way of life in the digital age. We need to have online advertising and marketing, but we need to do it, and it's not about any particular company here or sets of companies. It's about the overall practices that the industry has created to collect all this information and to use all this information with these very powerful multimedia, in their own words, immersive uh, 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 online advertising uh, services that are not understandable and controllable and definable by consumers. I think to me, it's very clear if you look at the issue of what, what's called sensitive data, which I'm hoping you're going to work on, and in particular, financial data. When you look at what happened during the, the recent financial crisis, mm -hmm. online advertising played a major role in, in encouraging people to take out those subprime mort mortgages. Online advertisers were, and, and mortgage companies were some of the biggest advertisers on the internet during the, 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 the boom period that led to this current crisis. People had no idea when they were taking out a mortgage or taking out a loan what exactly they were getting because this system was defining them in certain ways and making them various offers, once again, non-transparent. Uh, to, to them. And as a result, they, and I think we, have had to face uh, the consequences. That's why, just as with the financial system, we need some regulation here that, that puts the system into balance. Yes, they can thrive and build this business, and we can, we can be innovators, but yes, consumers get to ensure what data is being used and how, it to, and how it's used, and they have a chance to change it if it's in, in, incorrect. So, Consumer groups around the country are calling on you to enact legislation as soon as possible to bring fair information principles up uh, to the digital era. Self-regulation has failed. They've been working, with all due respect to my friends here, they've been working on self-regulation for 15 years, and all you have is more and more data collected every minute. Americans shouldn't have to trade away their rights to control their information and have some autonomy in their, in their affairs, whether it's buying a mortgage, looking up for prescription drug, or buying a car are doing anything else without having to give their, their data up. There's a balance. I hope you will help us restore it. There's a win-win possible here. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chester. Uh, now we uh, chair recognizes Mr. Corrin, Corrin, Corrin for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Rush, Chairman Boucher, and members of the subcommittee. I'd like to thank you on behalf of the Network Advertising Initiative for the opportunity to discuss both the economic benefits and the privacy implications of online behavioral advertising. The NAI is a coalition of advertising networks and other online marketing companies dedicated to responsible business practices and effective self-regulation. Originally founded nine years ago, the NAI has grown to include more than 30 online leading, lead, leading online advertising companies, including all 10 of the largest advertising networks. Today, through the NAI's website, consumers can learn more about or opt out of online behavioral advertising by any or all of the NAI's member companies across the many thousands of websites on which such advertising is served. Today's hearing focuses on both industry practice and consumer expectations. The NAI and its members are committed to online advertising practices that strike the right balance between consumers' economic and privacy expectations. We believe that consumers enjoy the diverse range of websites and services that they get for free thanks to relevant advertising but we must also provide consumers with meaningful notice and choice. Tens of millions of Americans benefit every day from free web content and services made available on the web because of banner advertising served by NAI members. These ad-supported services include news, blogs, 
video, photo sharing, and social networking services. NAI members support these websites by connecting them with advertisers and by using web browser cookies to serve their visitors with more relevant and compelling advertisements. NAI members provide websites with a broad variety of services. They help smaller websites combine their audiences so they can attract larger advertisers. They help advertisers gauge the success of their campaigns across multiple sites. And they also make online advertising more interesting and useful to consumers by using non-personally identifiable information about users' activity within an ad network to try to predict their likely interests. In the early days of online behavioral advertising, more than 10 years ago, advocates and regulators challenged industry to provide appropriate privacy protections around browser cookies. The NAI self-regulatory code was established to meet that challenge and continues to today to apply the same core principles for our members. First, users should receive clear and conspicuous notice on the websites that they visit where data is collected and used. Second, users should have the ability to opt out of behavioral advertising. Third, sensitive data should not be used for online behavioral advertising without a user's affirmative consent. Fourth, a user's affirmative consent should also be obtained if personally identifiable information is merged with information previously gathered about the user's web browsing within an ad network. As these technologies have matured and the online marketplace has diversified, the Federal Trade Commission has called on industry to broaden and enhance its approach to self-regulation. The NAI and its member companies believe that self-regulatory approaches should be as dynamic as the online marketplace that they serve, and we are moving quickly to respond. The NAI member companies are working to develop technologies that would support enhanced consumer notice in or around behaviorally-based banner ads. This would allow users to learn more about behavioral advertising and to make choices directly from the ad itself. Additionally, to help protect users' choices, the NAI is implementing technology to improve the durability of user opt-out preferences stored in browser cookies. The NAI believes that its current opt-out approach strikes the right balance in consumers' expectations for today's cookie-based advertising. The model combines an opt-out for the use of non-sensitive, non-personally identifiable information to deliver ads with an opt-in requirement for uses of sensitive or personally identifiable data. This preserves a default experience in which websites provide users with more rather than less relevant advertising. Users have multiple options to control behavioral advertising, either by using opt-outs offered by the NAI's members or their own easily accessible web browser tools. Any significant changes to this model, such as requiring a user's opt-in even to non-personally identifiable uses of cookies to improve ad relevance, could pose a profound risk to both the user and ex experience and the economic model for ad-supported web services. As they navigate, navigate from site to site, consumers could be inundated with recurring opt-in prompts asking their permission to serve relevant ads. Consumer rejection of this approach could uproot the revenue model that supports many websites today. It's vital to the continued growth of web services that the right balance is struck between the economic, technological, and consumer protection considerations relating to online advertising. The NAI looks forward to working with the subcommittees as they consider these important uh, online privacy issues. Thank you. <coughs> the chair, thanks to the gentleman. Now the chair recognizes Mr. Cleland for five minutes. Me. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Mr. Chairman, both you and a ranking member. Uh, as a leading uh, Internet expert and consultant, uh, I obviously have Internet companies as clients, uh, I, uh, which include wireless cable and telecom broadband companies in the communication sector and Microsoft in the tech sector. However, I want to emphasize my views today or my personal views and not those of any of my clients. What I want to do is talk about the Internet problem and the Internet solution. So what's the Internet privacy problem? Well, technology has turned privacy upside down. Before the internet, it was um, inefficient, it was costly, and it was difficult to collect private information. Now it's hyper-efficient, cheap, and easy uh, to invade privacy. So through inertia, what we have is a default finders keepers, losers weepers, privacy policy. Now second, we, uh, most Americans incorrectly assume that uh, the privacy they enjoyed offline in the past is the privacy they have online, and that's not, that's not true. Third, all the technology megatrends out there, social networking, cloud computing, uh, internet mobility, internet of things, 
all of them will dramatically increase privacy risks online. Fourth, there is a significant faction in the technology uh, um, community that really uh, um, take, views privacy negatively as, uh, in some parts, antithetical to uh, um, the behavioral advertising and the Web 2.0 model. Now, fifth, a problem is, is that increasingly the underground currency of the Internet is private data. Now, private information is very valuable. Uh, but, but in the absence of a system where consumers can insert, assert ownership and control over their private information, privacy can be taken away from them for free and profited from with no obligation to or compensation due to the affected consumer. Fifth part of the, or sixth part of the problem, and that is we now have a technology-driven Swiss cheese privacy framework, which may be the worst of all possible worlds. Simply, the haphazard framework we have gives an, a, a user no meaningful informed choice to either protect themselves or benefit themselves in the marketplace arena of their private information. So what's the solution? I think it's very simple. You have a consumer-oriented, consumer-centric approach that's technology and competition neutral. Think about it. It's consumers' private information that's being taken and exploited without their consent. Since it's consumers that are most at risk of having their information misused or, used or stolen, wouldn't it be logical for our privacy framework to be organized around the consumer? Now clearly, businesses should be free to fairly represent and engage consumers in a fair market transaction for their private information. Now it's fair market transaction where consumers are able to effectively understand and negotiate the risk and reward involved with sharing their private information. Moreover, since the consumer is the only one that knows which information about their personal situation or their views or their intentions or their interests, which ones they're comfortable with sharing, shouldn't it be the consumer that is empowered to make those decisions? So if Congress decides that it's going to legislate in this area, I think one thing is obvious, and that thing is, is that you should have a consumer framework um, that would be uh, superior to the current technology-driven framework. That's because it would emphasize protecting people, not technologies. It would empower consumers with both the control and the freedom to choose to either protect or to exploit their privacy. It would prevent competitive arbitrage by creating a level playing field. And it would allow you to stay current with the constant changing innovation because you're not technology oriented, you're consumer oriented. And lastly, you're going to be able to accommodate both sides, the people who care very much to protect their privacy, but also those who care less and would like to exploit their private information. So in closing, I think we can do better than a, the current finders keepers, losers weepers, privacy policy that's the de facto policy of the United States. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, for the opportunity to testify. The Chair thanks the gentleman. Now we were uh, engaged, the committee will engage the witnesses in a series of questions, and the Chair recognized himself for five minutes for the purpose of questioning the witnesses. Uh, Mrs. Toth, um, in your testimony, you discuss meaningful choice for consumers. and. This is a principle that everyone agrees is a, is a good one. However, it appears that the only choice for consumers using Yahoo is to opt out of receiving, quote, interest-based advertising, end of quote. It seems that they can't opt out of Yahoo's collection of information and tracking. Uh, can you clarify exactly what the consumer's choice is with Yahoo's opt-out. If consumers ask to opt out of behavioral advertising, does your company continue to collect data on their browsing habits? And then I have another question. Does the opt-out only stop the displaying of targeted advertising, or does it stop the collection of data uh, does your firm offer consumers any way to opt out of tracking and data collection? Would you ask, ask those three questions for me, please? 
Sure, so our opt-out, uh, you're correct, it's not an opt-out of collection of data, it's an opt-out of use of data. So there are uh, a number of reasons why we collect uh, data, uh, and primarily um, that uh, relates to the display of advertising. So advertisers pay us to, dis to, to show advertisements, and so we have to know if those ads were, were delivered and shown. So we collect information in order to report that information back to the advertisers. Uh, who are paying for those ads. But another reason why uh, has a lot to do with the way we operate our websites. So if we were to stop collecting data um, when a user opts out, then there are a number of users we, we suspect would opt out and engage in behaviors on the site uh, that may not be uh, legitimate behaviors, that may be abusive or fraudulent behaviors. So we're continuing to collect information, but when the user opts out, uh, we, are, we are no longer showing them behavioral advertisements. We are uh, opting them out of that use of their data. So we are a website that offers a number of different services. Ad serving is one of our many businesses. So we have other uses for the data, as I described. Um, so I think, I'm not sure if I understood uh, the other question specifically as, as being different from that one is um, maybe a misheard, but uh, there, so to the extent that data is no longer used for advertising, that's what the opt-out applies to. But the opt-out that we offer uh, is actually a very, it's very clearly provided to users and it is actually very easy to find. So we think that that actually matters a great deal. The other thing actually that I'll, I'll mention is that what we offer uh, on the back end is anonymization of that data within 90 days. So if users have a concern that there's a great deal of data being collected, we hope to be addressing that on the back end by anonymizing the vast majority of our data within 90 days. What's really notable about that is that our policy doesn't just apply to search log records or to a specific type of log file, but really all of our log systems, including the log systems that uh, inform our advertising uh, capabilities. So a consumer cannot opt out of data collection at all? The consumer can't opt out through the cannot data opt collection. Out. They of, cannot opt, opt out of data no, collection. No, they, they, there are other tools at the browser level that would mm. uh, address that. Sure. For us, our systems don't work that All way. Right. Ms. Wong, can you uh, answer the same questions uh, for me? Sure. Let, let me start by um, sort of describing our approach to privacy and data collection on our sites generally, because um, I don't know if you're, you're a regular Google user. Google actually has a design philosophy of always trying to minimize the amount of data we collect about a user in the first mm -hmm. instance. So almost all of our services actually don't require a user to provide any personal information at all. When you go to Google search, you don't have to register. You simply type in your search. Mm -hmm. If you type in a search and you're not signed in or registered with us, what that means is the only thing we get back is what all of us here, what all websites get, which is sort of a standard what we call log line that records a computer is asking you a question and that question comes with two things that can be identifying of user one is an ip address which your isp assigns to you and the other is a cookie which is what ann referenced um, neither of those things for google are tied to an individual you can't know it's nicole or chris or ann based solely on the ip address and the cookie so just to be clear about the type of data we collect um, we do provide an opt-out, uh, as I was demonstrating in our, in our presentation, for the use of that cookie and IP address data to target ads. In other words, when you, when you click on the opt-out, what it does is, instead of getting a unique cookie, which is a series of numbers and letters, what you get is what we call the opt-out cookie. And that opt-out cookie literally says in it, opt-out. So that the data that we collect goes into a huge pool of all users who have the same opt-out cookie. It's completely aggregated, which means we can't see an individual user in that pool of data that's been identified as opt-out. Uh, the chair, uh, time is, is up. The chair now recognizes the ranking member, uh, Mr. Rodonovich, for five minutes. And at the conclusion of his question uh, and answer, uh, <clears throat> Uh, the chair will relinquish the chair uh, to the chairman of the uh, communications uh, subcommittee uh, at, at the point in time. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, members of the panel. It's, your testimony is very interesting. My first question goes to Mr. Curran, is it? Um, from your testimony, I understand that you're involved in a broad industry-wide effort to create self-regulating principles. 
and that these principles are you're going to be ex releasing this inf you know these principles pretty soon I understand within about 30 days can you expand a little bit on what we can expect you to address on those and I'm particularly interested about the enforcement areas of of these principles you I need to punch here uh, there you thank go. you um, Actually, I think there are two different answers to your question because there are two different things going on. Um, and in my long-form testimony, I detailed uh, some of the work going on with the NAI in terms of our member companies, which are primarily uh, advertising networks and other online marketing companies, um, to uh, essentially further the development of technology that will allow, uh, as, as Ms. Wong showed you with her presentation of notice inside the banner ad, really to um, uh, get together to advance an infrastructure that would allow any entity uh, ser serving a, a, a behaviorally targeted ad or any party responsible for a behaviorally targeted ad to uh, deliver that kind of notice in connection with an ad. So that's and work that, that the NAI has been pursuing from a technological perspective. Right. Separately, I think okay. your question relates to a, a, a far broader um, industry dialogue that's been uh, not uh, led by the NAI, but instead by the IAB, the DMA, the 4As, uh, the ANA and also the, 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 the BBB. Um, that's a lot of acronyms. Uh, that's but, uh, much clearer now. Um, <laughs> uh, I think. Uh, uh, I think the. Uh, uh, I think the key takeaway here is that uh, certainly the FTC had indicated uh, that broader uh, self-regulatory approaches were needed for industry, and uh, that is very much an effort in that direction of actually establishing principles similar in spirit to those of the NAI to apply uh, on an ecosystem-wide basis. And my understanding is that uh, the, uh, on, uh, the, on, um, uh, the rollout of those principles is, uh, uh, is, is in weeks. Um, yeah. so, and, and we're very much supportive of, of those efforts, and I think uh, they are very much part of a trend of, of uh, really a momentum towards uh, uh, exactly what the FTC called for in terms of uh, uh, really a, a, right. a very vigorous engagement by India. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Wong, I'd, I'd love to ask you a question regarding uh, your, your comments or support of establishing a uniform online and offline framework for privacy. Now, uh, I'd love to have you clarify what uniform means and does it mean that, you, that it should apply to all entities and engage in collecting or using and sharing online information, whether they are ISPs or application providers? Should it be straight across the board or are there different applications? Yes, and, and I think I have two questions, uh, two <coughs> answers to that. Um, as an initial matter, Google and, and a number of the folks at the table here have been really working hard to think about federal comprehensive privacy legislation. Mm -hmm. And if I were to to encourage the committee to do anything, I think it is backing something like that because I, our our history on privacy legislation has really been about um, sectorally. Uh, uh, trying to to regulate privacy with children, with health, with with financial, so that for a user on the internet, their internet experience is seamless. They go from their bank to their doctor to their web service seamlessly and don't realize that different privacy laws apply. The importance for ensuring that users continue to trust the use of their data on the internet is to have baseline privacy law across industries. Um, yeah. and, and, and to get to your second question about... Well, let me ask this if I clarify it a, a little bit. When you say uniform, does that apply to, say, content providers that provide content, content over Google? Would they be, would they be um, subject to the same private, uniform, is that what you call uniform? online uh, uh, privacy. Right. So, so yes, that, okay. that there would be baseline standards for all companies in terms of notice to users, access and control for users, and security for that data. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Toth, in, in Yahoo, recently you announced that it will be, uh, you, that you will completely erase IP addresses at the end of its data retention period rather than just uh, deleting a few numbers of its practice of uh, uh, as is the practice of a number of your competitors. If you don't need the IP addresses for fraud prevention or anything else, what's the utility in keeping the IP address at all? And why, why the fractional numbers? Or why don't you just dump it right away? So our, um, actually, I think we actually have slides in there of our data retention policy and the process steps that we okay. take. So for the vast majority of our data, at 90 days, we de-identify the data. We, we apply a four-step process to remove identifiers. Okay. The IP address is one of those identifiers that's stored in the logs. 
Uh, and that, and for us, we, we completely delete that identifier at 90 days, mm -hmm. uh, with the exception of, of the fraud and abuse systems, which hold it for up to six months, um, and then it's deleted. So we, we store that data um, only for as long as we need it uh, for the purposes of, of providing our services, and then we de-identify the records, and that gets to the IP address. The IP address is typically in the in the context of, of use have more to do with uh, customizing a user's experience along the lines of, uh, of, of geography, those sorts of things. Um, but, but it is de-identified and it is removed at 90 days. So are, okay. does that answer your question? Good enough. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, I again want to express apologies to our witnesses for the lengthy delay. We were on the House floor a bit longer than we had anticipated, and you were very patient. We want to express the committee's appreciation to you for your willingness to stay with us and provide what has been some truly excellent testimony. I'm going to propound a series of questions and then recognize other members who are here. Uh, some have made the point in written testimony, and I've heard it made otherwise, apart from this hearing, that there can be a meaningless opt-in and a meaningful opt-out. And I would assume that the difference with regard to meaningfulness depends to some extent on the degree of disclosure that is made to the user. So what I would like is to get your statement of what you think the elements of a meaningful opt-out would be. Who would like to answer? Mr. Chester. Uh, thanks. That I think we need an opt-in. And my rule of thumb is that you know, this has to be done in a doable way to make well, commerce Well, Mr. Chester, work. before you alter the uh, question and answer right. the question you wish I'd ask, let, let me see if all we right. can get you or someone to answer the question I actually did ask, right. uh, Ms. Wong. I'll, I'll give it a try. I, I, and I agree with you, uh, with the concept of, like, there are good opt-outs and there are bad opt-ins. I, I think a bad opt-in is, you know, an opt-in slipped in a, in a long provision at the beginning of a contract relationship with, with your user that they forget over time. And so there could be continued uh, data collection in the life of your relationship with that user that the user's completely forgotten about. A good opt-out is an opt-out that's presented again and again to the user as a meaningful choice to them. So in, the, in, in our interest-based advertising, for example, one of the things that we are trying to do is to put ourselves in front of the user so that we encourage them to engage with their own data. That's the purpose of that Ads by Google link in the ad, because we want them to know when you're looking at this page, it's not just the New York Times you're looking at. The ad is from Google, and you should engage with that data. The purpose of our Ads Preference Manager is, again, to give the users a sense of control so that they change their behavior and start to engage and take control of their own data. Um, and I think that that so, so you would again make, and again. Um, you would make full disclosure to the user of what information is collected about the user. You would describe how that information is used once you have collected it. And then you would provide the opt-out opportunity. That's right. And would those be the meaningful elements of, of, of opt-out as far as you're concerned? I, I think that's right. The continued engagement with the user. All right. Now, let me ask Mr. Chester, who I know is very interested in taking part in this discussion, well, what, uh, what his response to that would be. Well, my rule of thumb is this, but it has to be done workably. The companies should be telling the consumer what they tell prospective clients. Because when you see what, the, and I included some of that in my testimony, when you see what they are telling their clients and their prospective clients, or when they're reporting on the results of the data collection uh, a system they've created with the advertising, they're talking about a massive collection of data that's far beyond the kin of what, uh, what, what might be presented uh, in, a, in a simple opt-out. Uh, so they need to be honest and tell people exactly what's about to happen. It can, be a, it can be a scale here, but if you read what they are doing, and including, frankly, the companies here, if you read what they're saying, and also how the applications, the interactive applications, when you read the literature, the interactive applications have been designed, the online video, to get people to give up more data. 
So they have to be honest at okay. first. All right. Th thank, thank you very much. Uh, if we were to draw a regulatory line of some sort that is focused on the collection and use of personally identifiable information, should we include within the definition of what is personally identifiable information the IP address? Mr. Chester is saying yes. Uh, let me see if any have any different views. No. Everyone agrees that, uh, well, okay, Ms. Wong. I'll give it a try again. Um, I think our position is that the, the IP address can be personally identifying depending on your relationship with the user. So for example, if you are the ISP that assigned that IP address, what it means is that you are actually billing that user every month and having credit card or billing information from them, which means you can in fact associate the IP address you as the ISP assigned with a real person. If you're in a position like, like Google where with an unauthenticated user where you don't know who is attached to that IP address, it's not personally identifiable. So you're, you're saying it would be personally identifiable if it is associated with other kinds of information about the user. That's right. Some of which might be quite sensitive and personal. That's right. You would, you, you would probably say it is not personally identifiable if you have that in isolation, perhaps with an opt-out cookie. Right. All right. I think I understand your position. Uh, in the time I have remaining, I, let me ask about the possible role that self-regulatory organizations might play in a statutory scheme that would extend privacy rights to uh, Internet users. Uh, several questions about that. I know we have uh, well-regarded SROs in existence today. Many of the major Internet companies are affiliated uh, with one or more SROs. And I'm concerned uh, if we add a statutory scheme on top of that in order to assure that every Internet user um, has the understanding that his online experience is secure because all websites will have to comply with a certain set of fundamental privacy assurances. How we uh, do that in association with continued viability and usability for the SROs. So just a couple of key questions. How would um, a user who feels aggrieved uh, because um, the uh, SRO, for example, may not have complied with the principles it signed up to comply with, get recourse? Should there uh, at some point be access to a federal agency to seek that recourse? And how could we make sure that every website actually complies with a minimum set of guarantees? So uh, who would like to try answering that? Mr. Cleland? Uh, well, I think, you know, you're trying to get to something that actually works, and I think you're trying to get to an accountable system. Uh, one idea I would offer that, you know, any, whether it's self-regulatory or um, governmental, is, is that there needs to be some audit that is occurring on a regular basis. Those can be audited, uh, automated audits, or they can be personal audits. They need to be random, because what you're talking about is meaningful. We're talking about accountable. And uh, if, you are, if you care about those two words and those two concepts and principles, there needs to be some verification. All right. Other comments, Mr. Chester? I guess, I'll, you know, there's a role for self-regulation, but I just have to underscore that self-regulation has failed. The only reason the NAI is upgrading its principles was because of the controversy that occurred over the Google DoubleClick merger, when all these consumer and privacy groups made so much trouble that then the FTC said, okay, we've got to do something about privacy principles, and then the NAI, after many years of being asleep, you know, decided, okay, we're going to revamp them. The only reason they, the companies have reduced their retention time is because the European Union has been pressing them. So it's the forces of regulation that's actually bolstered the failing self-regulatory system. So, we, like, so you would agree, would you not, Mr. Chester, that if the statute imposed certain fundamental guarantees and they, they meet your uh, definition of what those fundamental guarantees of privacy should be, for example, that an SRO that then enforces those fundamental guarantees or has those as its core principles that are a condition of membership, such an SRO could be effective, could it not? The, I think the history of self-regulation, certainly in media and telecommunications, like in the kids' area, has been that the self-regulatory structure is only as good as the law that has, in fact, okay. thank, within thank the foundation. You. On that note, my time has expired, and I'll recognize the uh, gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stearns, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And let me also reiterate your comments. Uh, this is the first time, I think, in the history of Congress that we had this kind of procedure. 
on the floor. We had over almost 55 votes, uh, and they were over almost eight hours. And um, so you have hit sort of a perfect storm. So your patience is appreciated, and uh, we appreciate you staying. Um, Ms. Toth and uh, Ms. Wong, any given day, people come to your sites. Let's call that X. They all come to your sites. How many of those, what percent of those people actually go to your privacy? Ms. Toth? We don't calculate it as a percentage. Uh, overall, uh, the number of page views that uh, of users who come to our privacy policy remains a fairly low number overall. So, um, and let's say just take a thousand people, just to make it easy. A thousand people. I you wouldn't. You couldn't even tell me if it's ten percent or one percent or half a percent. It's certainly far lower than one percent. Yeah. It so is. it's very, very small. Mm -hmm. And Miss Wong, about you. How yeah, I, you know what? I don't know, and I can try and get back to you with the number, but I, I, off the top of my head, I don't know the number of views. No one on your staff can just even give a ballpark? I mean, it, it's not 10 percent. I'm sure it's lower than the number of overall visits we get. I, here's what I, I do know, yeah. um, which is that a year ago or so, we started uploading videos to explain our privacy practices. Yeah. And what we're seeing there is that users are engaging with us in those because videos. Because it's a video. Okay. Because it's a video and they're rating them and telling us what works for them and what doesn't. And, and, and I know that notice is a really important thing for this committee. We have to find better ways than a pure privacy policy to engage with our users to make them And care. videos might be a good way. And videos now, might be a good each way. Each of you mentioned that you are willing to give to the consumer uh, the information that you have collected and give it in sort of in categories. Um, and is this information that you're going to give um, this has been synthesized, or you have put together a summary and given it to the customer. Will you let the uh, user actually see your raw data, or at least actually see what you collect? Will you ever allow him get to the point they can actually see what you collect? I would actually love it if we could. Um, I'd like you to see some of the data that we actually do collect, because I think it's. So I could actually yeah. see it if I wanted to, right. and so not just get your categories or. Huh. Well, we have a slide that um, that shows our log files or a sample of what we collect in the log files. Um, we we I don't think actually a consumer would engage with that in a way that would be meaningful for the consumer because it's a very technical expression of a user's interaction with us on the site. So what we do in our behavioral uh, in our in our estrus based advertising and the behavioral targeting systems that we use is to take those uh, visits and categorize them based on the types of interactions. So if a user visits sports, they'll have a score that indicates they visit sports. Uh, the actual log files themselves would probably not be uh, useful for a consumer to engage with. Um, it's, it's a series of, of uh, it, it's actually quite difficult to explain in, in, many, in, in plain English what is in a log file for a log. Okay, but, but the customer would have access to is what you're saying if they wish to. Well, the customer, um, we don't actually make it available because there are no tools that actually generate log files in a way that would be uh, easy, easily accessible for consumers. What we give consumers is ready access to our privacy policy, okay. educational links, uh, opt-out opportunities that are that are abundant across the site. So, if I mean, like the the demo that we did for you about our ads preference manager is is an attempt to make that interface real, right? With, which is demonstrating the interest categories that are assigned to a cookie in order to target advertising. Because I think Anne is correct that if a user won't read a privacy policy, they're surely not going to read code. No, okay, Mr. Chester. Before you, you can answer that question, also, um, what do you do with the bad actors? I mean, we sit here and we pass a bill and uh, we set up uh, opt-in and opt-out procedures, and we've got uh, Yahoo and Google. But what are you going to do with the bad actors and how, how, I mean, is it possible that in addition to developing this uh, legislation uh, so that all 50 states have one set because each state now is developing a different and so there might be a need for us in the federal level to develop it so that you don't have 50 states with 50 different privacies. So uh, I guess my question is twofold. What do we do with the bad actors and is it a possibility that you could set up good housekeeping seals that everybody would say, ah, I'm safe with this site, bingo, I can go into it and feel comfortable, and the bad actors wouldn't get it, and then you could differentiate and say, I'm not going to fool with those. I think if you passed, it, passed the legislative standards, right, that would, be the base, that would be the baseline. Everybody would know, basically, they're, they're, they're protected. You now have a changed FTC, potentially, and hopefully you're going to reauthorize it uh, uh, soon. I mean, the, the FTC 
has been hampered in going after the bad actors. It's been constrained from really looking as closely at this market as it should be. It hasn't had the resources, and it's, it's, it's also been uh, uh, um, in, in conflict. There's now a, a new a chairman there. There's a new director of consumer protection. They really want to move on this issue, and they could, in fact, be empowered to go after uh, the bad actors in a much more uh, uh, vigorous uh, way. Of course, we don't want to see state preemption, uh, consumer advocacy. We want to uh, let no, the, uh, I states. Now, when I had hearings on this yes. when I was chairman, one of the problems we found is that there was no reciprocity between countries, and you had the bad actors outside the United States. And so oh. it, part of, and parcel of this is develop legislation uh, with other countries where you have reciprocity so you can go after corruption and fraud, and there is that uh, uh, ability to do it otherwise. No one's going to comply with the federal bill, and they'll be in another country. Well, I, I do think we're falling behind the Europeans, and it's something ironic. They're going to have better privacy policy and build a whole new online commerce business that's privacy friendly while we're lagging because they're uh, uh, moving. Look, there's a lot of the, the, the market is really being shaped, and this is what, uh, something positive about the industry. We're creating this global interactive market. Right. Yes, there are European companies. Yes, there are Asian companies. But they, in fact, have created the standard, and that is terrific. What okay. happens here can, can shape the rest of the world. As for profiles, you can see company after company says, I have all this information about an individual consumer. I would hope that under your legislation, that consumer could see all the detailed information that's being collected about them. Mr. Cleveland? Yeah, I think uh, if, if Congress is serious about this, you need to focus on the concept of deterrence. I mean, uh, if uh, privacy violations or repeated violations are important, there needs to be a significant uh, penalty of whatever is appropriate. But if legislation is passed and there's no deterrent and there's also no, um, no uh, significant way of getting caught, meaning independent audits of some type, it will not have teeth, it won't be meaningful, and it won't be accountable. So I really, if you're serious about this, you really need to be thinking about how do you take um, unaccountability, which is a problem across the internet, not just with privacy, and, and try and address that and create more accountability. It's never going to be perfect, but it's a key. Mr. Chairman, if you'll uh, give me a little uh, slack here, I, I just want to bring this last question, uh, which really is also we as legislators are, are grappling with, and that's uh, the regulatory side versus the enforcement. Mr. Cleveland talked about the enforcement. And we have two uh, jurisdictions here. We have the FCC and the Federal Trade Commission. So I'd like to just start to my left and just go down. And perhaps you could give us a feeling of, of how you think this should bill should uh, come together in terms of jurisdiction with the FCC and the Federal Trade Commission. I mean, some people think, well, the FCC uh, could be the enforcer and the FTC could be the regulator. But I'd, I'd be curious, each one of you, if you don't mind, take a few moments, Mr. Chairman. I would see this as closer to, uh, to an FTC issue. Uh, I think it's fundamentally a consumer <coughs> protection issue. So both for regulatory and enforcement? Yes. Okay. I would agree with Mr. Felton. We've worked for a very long time with the Federal Trade Commission on issues of consumer privacy online. Um, we feel very comfortable and, and believe that they are, are well versed to address this issue. Ms. Wong. I have to say I feel a little bit out of my depth in terms of understanding jurisdiction between federal agencies, but um, like Anne, and we've worked for quite a while with the FTC. My experience in watching them over the last 10 years is they've brought very effective enforcement actions. Um, I would say as well that we've worked extensively with the FTC um, so far along this, and they also have a great deal of expertise in the competition area, which is one of the things that's driving better technology. Um, throughout the industry in terms of providing users more transparency and more control over their data. So the FTC has developed a great deal of expertise in this area. I'd like to see a joint task force because, in fact, the FCC will have expertise at the network level, and particularly with cases with DPI, deep packet inspection, there's a real role here for the FCC. But when it comes to the ad itself and the data and the consumer experience itself, it's the FTC. Yeah. I, I mean, because, you know, this is going to envelop, once you get broadband more, you're going to see voice over Internet. You're going to see everything over the Internet. And so all communication is going to be through that media. And so, you know, I think the FCC has a part and parcel role. I, I think I'd echo a, a, the, a, the, the nod to the FTC, certainly in terms of our business model uh, for, for cookie-related activity. The FTC, for over a decade, with its workshops on the technology, has been instrumental in uh, 
raising awareness of the policy and technical issues and uh, very much the determinant of the setting the direction for self-regulation. Um, and uh, as for other business models and other regulatory schemes, I, I, I wouldn't be able to speak to that. Okay, Mr. Cleveland. Uh, FTC is a lead in close coordination with the FCC. The only problem would be is if jurisdiction got in the way of passing, if you want to pass legislation. That would be the only tragedy. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. Stearns. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Weiner, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. If, could, could I ask, um, uh, uh, perhaps for the uh, for uh, Ms. Wong, to talk a little bit about your experience developing Chrome, which is your your um, your search engine, your uh, um, what's it called? Browser. Your browser. Wouldn't it be possible through that vehicle to when you download it? get your first page is, tell us what information you'd like to know about the pages you're visiting and what information that you'd like to share and maybe a collection of boxes you can check or not check. It's similar to kind of what Facebook tries to do, although they don't do it right in your face. They kind of have, you can shave this, not to. That seems to be even more, even a better place to think about the true gateway to the experience. If I wanted to do that, through Chrome. Would I be able to do that in some way? I mean, I know I can go and erase the cookies and I can erase my browser history, but can I do something like that? Right. Thank you for that question. Um, You're welcome. I, I, and I'm a little bit at a disadvantage because I'm not an engineer, just a lawyer. Um, and our engineers do amazing things. I think that, uh, so I, I, I don't know that there's any limitation on what they can do. I know they're working very hard to build privacy controls. Well, into perhaps Chrome. if I can interrupt you, maybe Mr. Felton can tell me about the technology possible here. Uh, sure. The, uh, the information flows that um, users might be concerned about uh, mostly happen not at the browser, but uh, after the user has interacted with uh, a website or a content provider. So what that means is that technical controls would exist mostly not in the browser, but in the websites themselves. But let me interrupt now, on that point. But if you, you have a fairly finite number of browsers that most people use, let's say for the purpose of this conversation it's five. You know, I don't know. I mean, that, that basically probably accounts for, for most of what people do. And the browsers are themselves competitive with one another. You know, you can argue that the browser industry grew out of people's dissatisfaction with Explore. So why couldn't you say that if you want your website to come up when you're traveling through Firefox, you have to have certain of your own information that you're giving us about what we can tell our users? Can't, isn't that kind of a technical solution a solution, but a technical way to kind of serve as a gatekeeper for a lot of websites. Yes, and, and certainly there are things uh, you could do along those lines to, to, uh, so that the browser could help the user express their preferences and the browser could, uh, uh, in a technical way, query a site and see what promises the site makes about uses of data. There have been efforts to do this in the past. There was a standardization effort called P3P, the Platform for, Pri for Privacy Preferences. Um, which defines such a standard, and uh, for reasons that are a, a subject of debate, um, the standard didn't stick. It wasn't popular. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I think this is a, uh, a fruitful a approach, and, um, uh, and I, for one, would be happy if, um, if the companies got together and had a discussion again about how to do this. Mr. Kelly, tell us a little bit, if you could, about your experiences in in stepping on the toes of people's privacy concern. I mean, it seems to me that we, to some degree, have, have three companies that have succeeded because consumers with a lot of different choices have chosen to use Google, chosen to use Yahoo, chosen in large numbers to go to Facebook. Could it be that the reason they're choosing your three services in particular is that you are the you're being self-selected by an active consumer marketplace that thinks the privacy works on your sites. Now, you just had an experience, I guess it's an ongoing one, where you've had a kind of a conversation with your members mm -hmm. about privacy. How does it work differently on yours than, say, what, what, um, what search engine do you use when you're searching the internet? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, usu it's usually Google. Okay. Mm -hmm. How is your privacy experience as a consumer of Google different than as a member of Facebook? Is it at all? Well, I, I think that 
all three of these sites have succeeded because they're providing great user experiences overall. And in some cases, those are around privacy. And, and because we've based a business on identity and personal information and the effective sharing of that with people who uh, share a social context with you, um, we knew going in that privacy was going to be a critical issue for us. And our goal has been to build technologies that allow people to make choices. So one of the things that, that's gotten lost in a lot of the mix of, in the discussions of social networking is that friending, whether you friend somebody or not, and how you connect to them is in and of itself a privacy setting. Uh, it determines what information that you see on Facebook, and that's been a great experience for us. When you look at, at a Google or a Yahoo as a search engine, um, they're looking to deliver a different experience there. They're looking for you to type in a word or two and get back something that they think is the most relevant uh, experience for you um, to get you to the page that you need to go next. If you use other services on those, uh, on, on those sites, um, they're providing different, different experiences there. Um, our goal has been to build technology that empowers users and lets them make their own choices about how they share information. We've aimed to extend that into the advertising realm as well. Mr. Chester, I know you want to answer this question, but let me, let me build on it. You can go ahead and, and for my last few seconds, you can answer. But take me back to 1986, or even 1996. I don't even know when this phenomenon all began. You could buy someone's um, credit report from three different companies. You could probably find aggregators of information that help car dealers figure out who to send their information to. You could probably scrub public records to find out what kind of a home that they own, how much taxes that they pay. It seems to me that there have always been resources that allowed someone to do 75% of what you described in your testimony as the thing we're protecting against. And we've acted here in Congress to try to limit access to that information. But to some degree, wouldn't you agree that consumers have pretty much now have a lot of tools that inform their experience. I would argue without even knowing it, I bet you there are places I can go on the internet to even find little software plugins I can probably download to let me know who's doing what with what websites are good or bad at protecting information. So it's a two-part question. One, isn't a lot of the stuff that you're most concerned about going to be out there whether you don't plug into the internet at all? And, and secondly, isn't to some degree the marketplace Allowing is aren't consumers allowing the the winners to be the good privacy companies? So why don't you take both both pieces? Polls after polls after survey, including the one that UC Berkeley just released about a week ago, ten days ago, say that the most users, most consumers, have no idea about what's being collected, how it's being used, how it really works. I honestly believe, and I think this is going to come out as part of this debate. And frankly, that's why we need good privacy legislation because it's going to undermine public confidence. People don't really know what's going on inside Facebook and the third-party developers and all the data flowing out. They don't know what Google is collecting across its various interests. If they knew, they would, in fact, I think, be more concerned. So consumers don't know. The polls uh, uh, sh uh, show that. This is a whole different world here, right? I want it, then it was back in, in 1996, 1998, when we did the Children's Act. You're talking about the instantaneous merging of a vast number of offline databases with online behavior, minute by minute, that is adopted to an individual's actions and reactions with various online environments, including all the personal information they put on their social networks. This is a completely different system that's been created. And, and, and finally, you know, I mean, I have a 16-year-old. I look at this as the world that will be here very soon. We will be buying our mortgages on this mobile phone not, in a not too distant future. This is the dominant way we're gonna be doing business through the PC and, and, and the mobile phone. It's a whole different world that has been created. On the one hand, we should be proud of it. They created it for us. We just have to make sure that consumers are protected. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Weiner. The uh, gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when we talk about opt-in opt versus opt-out, and, and I would imagine for business model purposes, uh, opt-out is the preference because if you force somebody to opt-in, I, I would think it would probably limit the number of people that would want their data to be collected on the front end. Uh, but if they do go through the process of opting out, 
are they actually stopping their personal data from being collected, or are they just not getting the targeted advertising? And, and if Ms. Toth could start. When a user when a user is opting out, uh, for us that is an opt out of not collection but of use of the information. Um, but I also want to be careful about the the use of the term personal information because uh, very often what's being conveyed to us is information that's specific only to a browser that's used to customize advertising. Uh, but even that level is is what the user is, is able to opt out of in terms of that data being used. Right, and there are different levels, of course. If if you're just going onto a browser, and I think Ms. Wild Wong talked about that, if I, if I just go on to Google and do a search, mm -hmm. uh, there's different information, maybe just my IP address, but then if I actually use Yahoo for an email account, mm -hmm. then clearly I'm going to be giving you a whole lot more information, and, and then you'll have access to that, and if I choose to opt out of that, uh, what am I opting out of there? Am I Am I, are you not going to be collecting that data anymore, or are you just not going to be getting the targeted advertising? So uh, the way that we do it at Yahoo is that when a user opts out, we are no longer showing them targeted advertising, and we're not using their information in that particular way. <laughs> Yahoo offers a wide array of products and services, as you mentioned, email, search, uh, a wide array of different Maybe types. social right. network Some services. Social networking, exactly. So when a user opts out, we opt them out of, of the the delivery of targeted advertising. Um, but we also recognize that users may not want us to have that much information about them. So we take great pains to de-identify the data as soon as we can. We, we spent over a year looking at every single product, every single data system at Yahoo to really try to minimize the amount of time that we hold data about users. Right, uh, and, I, and I, I know we've got limited time, so Ms. Wong and then Mr. Kelly. Um, sure. I, I, I think it's roughly the same answer that I gave earlier, which is we really collect very little data from users when they're searching um, the IP address and, and the cookie. And the opt-out for, for our interest-based advertising is an opt-out for those targeted ads. And what it means that is that the cookie you're getting is not uniquely identified. It just drops the query that you sent us or, or, or the data that we've gotten into a bucket of all opt-out cookies. So, and because our service is based on sharing personal information with others, we inevitably end up collecting a great deal of personal information so that we can effectively share it with others and, and, and actually use people to retain their, uh, uh, retain people's photo albums for them, um, which they usually expect to be retained indefinitely. Um, in certain circumstances, and particularly in our advertising products, where we're innovating and where people may not be used to a presentation in a particular way, we've allowed for opt-outs in those instances because we think it empowers users. It allows them to say, I'm not comfortable with this at this point, um, but they can reconsider that at, at, at a later time. Our, our goal overall, and I think the goal of this committee and any legislation it considers and any enhancement of regulatory authority should be to make sure that consumers have real power to make those choices. We've tried to embody that in technology as much as we can, and you're here trying to embody it in law and trying to encourage the regulatory agencies to continue to meet their, their burdens and their obligations under, under existing law. And, and I apologize to interrupt. I've only got a minute left. Uh, there is something else I want to ask, especially as it relates to uh, the email services, uh, if, and both for Yahoo and, and, and Google, if you can answer this. If, if a user of, of Yahoo or Google or, or any other email service uh, decides that they want to opt in or they, they don't opt out uh, to, all of those, uh, to all of those agreements and you can collect whatever information you want from them. Uh, but let's say they then send me and I don't have that service and, and they send me an email. I didn't agree to any of those issues. Uh, do you read emails from people that are uh, a Yahoo or a Google uh, email subscriber? Uh, do you read through those emails to gather information in any way? Yahoo does not scan the content of, of email communications in order to show targeted advertising. Or for any other purposes? We, we don't show, well, there are only some purposes for, uh, the, there is a process that actually removes viruses from, from email that's an automated process, but we don't use the content of communication. For advertising. advertising. Ms. Wong? Yeah, so we're, we're using that same technology that scans for viruses and also scans for spam. It, it's basically technology that looks for patterns in text. And we use that not only for the spam blocking and, and the viruses, but also to serve ads within the Gmail user's experience. So importantly, like 
the the so inter- if two people are exchanging an email about a sporting event mm-hmm. and, and they're talking about going to the game and and then maybe they're going to want to go out for a drink afterwards uh, could they maybe then expect to get an advertisement about uh, which different bars are offering specials after the game? So they won't get an email with an advertisement. But for but a Gmail, make... only the Gmail user will be able to see ads that show up just like they show up on the side of our search results that are keyed to specific words. They, they're keywords just as if you typed them into our browser mm-hmm. that are calling from our repository of millions of ads to deliver uh, an ad that's targeted to the content that you're reading. So if that was a two-way conversation, one was the Gmail subscriber who agreed to or didn't opt out of uh, the privacy, but the other person in that conversation was not a Gmail user, clearly not someone who opted in or opted out, uh, would any part, because in an email thread, uh, they could have had maybe four or five replies and and you've got a long thread built up, and it's not just going to be the Gmail's uh, information that's going to be there. The the person who's a non-Gmail user is also going to be included in that thread. Would any of that information that be read? That non-Gmail user will not have any ads targeted to them at all. Is any of their data collected their from data that conversation? Sits, their data sits in their the recipients, the Gmail recipients' email archive. Or, so if, or if you've got algorithms that went through that Gmail email, then when you were reading things in that email, some of the things that you were reading were would have been part of the thread of a non-Gmail subscriber. That's right. How does your privacy policy handle that? Because that person clearly has absolutely no knowledge of you reading their email. They surely didn't agree to it, and they didn't have the ability to opt out. So how is that handled? Yeah, just to be really clear, um, this is, there are no humans reading email at our company. But even if it's a, if it's a software algorithm it's a software uh, that's trained algorithm. to go through and look for keywords or key information, their email address, of course, is going to be in there. So you would be able to know who that person is, at least from their email address. But also you would out, be able to have access to uh, the information. Uh, do you have anything in those algorithms that prevents that information that's not Gmail related to be read? from a person who didn't agree to or have the ability to opt it, out of your privacy? It would privacy. have to be that the user decided they did not want to receive that email from the person who sent it to them. So, so this is fully in control of the Gmail account holder, and, and they can refuse to receive emails from certain people. So you would be putting the burden now of privacy you, collection on a user of Gmail, are, uh, someone are, who actually has a Gmail account? So, so our user... But, but your user actually knew what your policy was and yes. could today, right now, go online. As you showed, you've got many opportunities for your users to opt out. That's right. The person who's the third party, who's the non-Gmail subscriber, who's part of that thread, does not have that same access. So how, how can you put the burden on the person who sent the email? No, no, no. The person who sent the email has... They, they have sent their email to their friend. That, that user is not going to get any ad targeted them. We're not going to have any information about that but user But was any of their information but read? But for the fact that we hold their email because we're the email service provider for the Gmail account holder, which is the same as any other webmail service. And I guess the real question is, how is that person, the, the Gmail subscriber clearly has the ability to protect their privacy, to opt out mm-hmm. if they so choose. Maybe some of their data is still collected, the but they could opt out. But the third party that they sent the email to who then replied back to them, who's contained in that thread, doesn't have that same ability, but yet their data is subject to being searched in the same way. And so how, I guess that's... That's true, but that occurs with every webmail service because every webmail service scans their email. I'll ask Ms. Toth if that's... Is that... Every webmail service scans their email for spam, scans it for viruses. It is the same. Uh, but also process. for targeted advertising, uh, I think you, you said you all do scan it for targeted advertising. Ms. Ms. Toth said they do not. We do not target. We don't. Uh, and I guess in the case where they are scanning it for other services that would be maybe sold to a, to a third party, how does the person protect their privacy when they never had the same opportunity to opt out that the original Gmail subscriber who sent the email was able to right. have the same access. To be very clear, no user's information is sold to any third party. No information about the sender of an email to a Gmail account 
is kept. Well, but if double is well, double uh, clicking, uh, Mr. Squeeze, uh, you're you're now past ten minutes of time, and we're going to wrap up. Uh, it, yeah, if I could get that in writing, maybe witness. the answer to that. Thank uh, you. That's fine. If, if any of the witnesses would like to respond to that last question in writing, that would be highly appropriate. The uh, gentleman from Vermont is recognized next, Mr. Welch, for five minutes. Uh, thank you. I want to join my colleagues in uh, apologizing for our delay and uh, appreciation for your patience. Um, although I think I might have rather have your job today than ours. <laughs> uh, Ms. Wong, in your written testimony, you noted that the committee should continue our efforts to explore the privacy issues. I mean, this is obviously an incredibly difficult issue, uh, both because of the complexity of making this work and, and, and assuring confidence to users uh, and because of basic questions about what should be private and what isn't. Uh, I'm asking that you expand on that and what ongoing efforts uh, are, is Google making uh, about the merging of online and offline data and the issues that are created as a result of that. So I'll start by asking you if you would comment on that and, that and probably ask a few others as well. Sure. And, and I actually think there's, this is a multidimensional question. I, I think absolutely there's an obligation on industry to do the right thing because the trust of our users is incredibly right. important. I also think that there's a role for groups like Mr. Curran's group, uh, the, the, the self-regulatory groups, which continue having us innovate on best practices. I think the, the best thing that has happened in the last few years <coughs> is that all of the major internet companies are competing to create better privacy technologies, and that is really phenomenal. There is also a role for government because, to be very clear, there are bad actors. And so there, there is an, a role for oversight into uh, the range of, of players on the ecosystem and, and the conduct that they engage in. And the thing that I think is, is most important, and, and the reason it should apply to both online and offline, is that there, the companies that you have here all face our users, are all invested in, in deepening the relationship with our users. There are companies that do not face the public, mm -hmm. that are behind it, and that need more oversight because nobody knows what they do with their data. Mr. Curran, you want to comment? Do you have anything else to add? I mean, that's a kudo to you for the role that Very kind. you play. Um, I, I'd, I'd simply say uh, I, I think uh, we have a, an obligation to uh, tell you about our successes and and our areas of improvement as self-regulatory organizations um, as it relates to, and also to, uh, I think, to work with you to explain the uh, uh, somewhat complicated technologies that go around the different business models. Um, I, I, I don't believe that I have a, a diverse membership so that we're not at a position of having a, a legislative view at this time, but we, we are very much committed to um, educating the committee on the technologies, and I think today's hearing has been very helpful in that in terms of uh, in, in effect, um, helping you discern the exact technical uh, infrastructure that goes into all of this <coughs> online advertising. Well, let me come back to Mr. Kelly. You know, it's, it, the, the Congress is never going to be able, obviously, to address technical issues. Uh, it's not our competence. It's not our job. It's not what we should do. Um, what specific things in terms of policies, I'll ask you, Mr. Kelly, would it be you, would you be recommending that Congress do in order to uh, protect privacy, which is our proper concern, but do it in a way that doesn't uh, strangle uh, innovation? And and that that is a, a critical role that you do have is to protect the innovation in in American technology and and how we've been able to lead the world in this area. Um, but obviously, protecting the privacy of American consumers is it's critical to us and to, and to other companies in the technology industry, but not everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are many actors out there who are tasked and see their role as gathering data and building personal profiles of people with no notice, no consent, no control. Um, I think that, that the Congress's regulatory action should be largely directed there. Um, we have a set of existing and extensive regulations that we've talked uh, tonight about our work with the FTC uh, as a technology industry um, in this area that where there are, there are uh, bans against deceptive practices um, and other activities, but still there are many technology companies out there, whether they be spyware, 
uh, vendors, whether they be um, sort of uh, just surreptitious uh, collectors of and, and, and aggregators of personal data um, that, that, that deserve the attention of this committee, the Congress, and, uh, and existing regulators. Okay. Uh, thank you. My time has almost expired, and I yield the balance of my time. Could I answer? <laughs> Up to the chairman. I think I'm almost out of time. Yeah, that's fine. Go ahead, Mr. Cleland. Yes, the, I think the key concept of what you're looking for um, is, uh, that the FTC and others should build on is longstanding fair representation law. We obviously have a huge gap. Jeff mentioned a lot of the uh, um, polls out there. Consumers don't have a clue about all the stuff that's being collected on them. Not a clue. And so if you believe in fair representation and you take the facts of all the people that have been uh, um, dealt with in the Internet and they don't know what's going on, there is a serious breakdown in fair representation. Mr. Chester, please. Very briefly. All the companies here, including the members of NII, as far as I can see, and, all right, are increasing the amount of data they're collecting on consumers, right? It's, it's, it's not that there's a question of best practices. They are building and expanding the data collection. That's the nature of the business. That's the nature of the online advertising system, to, to build out these very sophisticated uh, um, uh, appro approaches. Therefore, you need to have rules. You need to, have, you need to bring p p a PII up to date, you know, because you don't need to know your name anymore to know who you are. You need to protect sensitive data, and you have to have the FTC be a better watchdog. With that, uh, Mr. Welsh, your time has expired, and uh, let me say thank you once again to our witnesses for what truly has been an informative session, long, long delayed, but uh, well worth our time talking to you, and uh, we, we thank you very much for taking your time all day, in fact, to talk to us. Um, I, I have uh, clearance for unanimous consent from the minority to place in the record a letter to the subcommittee, the joint subcommittees actually from the Federal Trade Commission concerning the subject of today's hearings, a letter from Data Foundry, uh, a, a data company based in Austin, Texas, without objection, those will be made a part of the record. And without objection, the record of this proceeding will be kept open for a period of three weeks so that other members of the subcommittee can submit to our witnesses questions in writing. And as you receive those questions from the members, if you could respond to them promptly, that would be much appreciated. Uh, well, with thanks again to you for uh, an excellent hearing. This hearing stands adjourned. C-SPAN today, syndicated columnist...